Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Merci sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. Let <laughs> me <laughs> just say that. We'll talk about that <laughs> later. We interview authors on The Gary Bisbee Show because they provide new perspectives and framing for traditional leadership ideas. The process of writing a book by nature is introspective and thoughtful. Authors have researched, reflected, written, and rewritten each idea that their book explores. So today we're turning to three authors to explore their thoughts on conflict, courage, and regret. We'll hear from Amy Gallo, a Harvard Business Review contributing editor and co-host of the Women at Work podcast. She's also the author of a forthcoming book, Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone, Even Difficult People. Next, we'll listen to Professor Jim Deturt, who is Professor of Business Administration and Public Policy at the University of Virginia and author of Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. To wrap up, we'll turn to Daniel Pink, six-time New York Times best-selling author. His latest is The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. To begin, let's hear from Amy Gallo on how we can be better at conflict. A lot of times, which is understandable, when we're under stress, and conflict often feels stressful, it feels like a threat, which signals this um, you know, stress response where cortisol, the hormone cortisol runs through our system, we lose access to our prefrontal cortex, we you know, go into that fight or flight mode, and we become naturally narcissistic. So we sort of lose sight of the other person or we tell ourselves a story about the other person, right? Like Gary is a passive aggressive jerk and always has been, he's doing it again, right? You, you, and you feel that story is so true. So I think one of the most important things you can do is try to think about the other person in an empathetic way. And I don't mean that you have to be kind and generous to someone who's being rude to you. It's really a strategic move for you to get out of that rumination, get out of that self-focus so that you can be in a more collaborative stance when you have the art, the discussion that you need to have. So that's one point I would say. Um, the second is, that you know what oftentimes we just sort of dive right into the conversation without doing a lot of prep um i don't you know i was never sat down in a classroom or in my family or in college or even in a job and been told here's how you have a disagreement right and most of us think we should be instinctively good at it so we just sort of treat it as a normal interaction but it does require some care and thought to do it well and so my, you know, the second thing I'd say to people is spend some time ahead of time really laying out what do you know about the situation? What facts are true? What questions do you have? What might be an assumption on your part? And the, the question I like to ask myself as often as possible, which really requires putting your ego down, is what if I'm wrong? Right? What, what, would, what would the scenario be like if I am incorrect about this? and what would I do differently? Because I think that really opens you up to having a productive conversation with the other person. Conflict management is still like any other. It requires preparation and practice and is fundamental to effective management. Conflict also requires courage. So next, we turn to Professor Deturt to describe how leaders can promote courage. There's a difference between acknowledging that people are afraid and telling them to just buck up and be courageous anyway, versus acknowledging that people are afraid and therefore doing things that would help change that for them. And so I don't see the role of very senior leaders as being to encourage courage. Because I really, I, I, what I really think is that if you're a CEO and you stand up there, you're a hospital head and you stand up there and say, hey folks, 
I need, I'm here to encourage courage. We need to see more courage. What you're essentially saying is, hey, I realize that there's a lot of fear in this system. I don't intend to do anything about that, right? So get it together and be courageous anyway. Well, you know, that's kind of a terrible way to lead, in my opinion. So I think what, you know, what great leaders, especially as they become more senior would do is they'd say, I need to acknowledge fear exists and I need to start doing things to change that. Some of that, frankly, would be quite courageous on your own part as a leader. Um, it would mean that when your people see you around your own bosses, they see you be willing to challenge in respectful ways. They see you going to bat for them. They see you being innovative rather than a yes man or woman, right? So one thing you do is you just model the same behaviors you would hope your people would take. And you stop fooling yourself and thinking that if everybody behind your back saying you're the weakest, softest leader they've ever been around, then you are not modeling what you're hoping for. Um, two, I think this is where, you know, some of this uh, language around vulnerability comes in. If you don't ever, as people's leader, say, I don't know, help me. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Let's fix it. If you won't do those things, then you're not creating the conditions for people to think you actually want to be told the truth, right? So, so you have to do that kind of modeling. And then I think the third sort of set of courageous actions that leaders could do to address people's fear is be willing to change some of the systems that frankly um, are inconsistent with what you're espousing, right? So you can tell people all day long, we, 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 we want to be innovative. We value agility and creative thinking and innovative behavior. But if everything in your pay scheme pays for accomplishment of established metrics, then you don't really want innovation. If people can look around and say, hey, who got promoted? And everybody that got promoted were the yes men and women and nobody that's an innovative out of the box thinker got promoted, then your system's not aligned. Leaders play an active role in creating a culture of courage. However, sometimes courageous acts go wrong. To wrap up, Daniel Pink will discuss the power of regret. If you look at some of the benefits of regret in dealing with them properly, you know, we're talking about decision-making, negotiation, strategy. Like those are things obviously that, 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 that leaders do. Um, I think there's something to be said as a as a very like just as a very small starting practice that what leaders should do and one of the things that i'm trying to do in this book in this basket of ideas is normalize regret is normalize regret and i want to normalize regret because it's normal all right and so so um so leaders can help in that process by doing something very simple you know you go to a, a meeting or something like that and at the meeting you say let me tell you about one regret that I have. Let me tell you what I learned from it. And let me tell you what I'm going to do about it. And I, I think even so, and, and that is going to, I think that that is, is, is powerful and catalytic on a couple of dimensions. The first is that um, we sometimes fear that when we disclose our mistakes and our vulnerabilities, people will think less of us. And there's a lot of evidence showing that's wrong, that they actually think more of us. They admire our courage. Uh, they, it builds affinity. So it's a, it's a way for a leader for her to build affinity. The second thing is that it um, it it normalizes it normalizes regret and allows people to actually talk about and surface their regrets and try to make sense of them and draw and draw lessons from them. And so um, and the more that we are able to, you know, individually and collectively look at our mistakes and not terrorize ourselves for them, but examine them almost scientifically. Ooh, look at this mistake. Let me hold it up to the light. You know, examine it um, and draw lessons from it. We're gonna we're gonna improve in the future. So to, to me, that's the single biggest thing a leader can do. Talk about one of our regrets. Ex don't just leave it there though. Explain what you learned from it, and then tell explain what you're gonna do about it. Regret is uncomfortable, but when channeled, it can be transformative. When leaders share their regrets, they can create an opportunity for powerful conversation and work toward preventing future regrets. At its core, leaders are leading the whole people, not just roles like nurses and engineers. This means grasping human psychology, redirecting emotions, and finding compromise in less than ideal circumstances. This is a process requiring practice, introspection, and then more practice.